Right, good afternoon, everybody. I'm David Rutter. I'm a solution architect from Capgemini. And today I wanted to talk to you about digital innovation in the factory. And what I find exciting about digital innovation in the factory, what I see about Factory 4.0, is we're bringing together two different worlds, the IT world and the OT world, operation and information technologies coming together. So can I have a show of hands in the audience? Who considers themselves more on the factory side, operational technology? Anybody? And who can, a few hands, good. <laughs> and how many people consider themselves IT? Most, okay, good. So I've arranged the talk for both audiences because it is about bringing together these two, these two worlds. So it's my, my clicker is working, good. So I'm going to cover some basic terminology, so we're all on the same wavelength, and then we'll look at some of the drivers of changing the factory, what that means and how we implement it, how we deliver it, and then I'll cover off some of the Capgemini success stories and technologies that we've got. So firstly, what is IoT? IoT was, I guess, first invented in 1982 when some American students at university connected up um, one of their vending machines. And from then on, we've had connected devices. But IoT is a little bit more about that. It's about putting real services off the back of it. Industrial IoT was a term that was invented by GE. And it's really about putting the same technologies we're using in IoT into the industrial world. But it's much more than that. I mean, we, we've seen vendors who, um, factories where they've gone in and connected, let's say, energy meters onto their machines. That's IoT, industrial IoT, but that's not what the function, that's not what factory industry 4.0 is really about. So let's talk a little bit about what is industry 1.2.3.4.0. .4 the first industrial revolution was driven by steam and water. The second industrial, second industrial revolution, we're talking about how do we mechanize things? How do we mass produce and the, the adoption of electricity? The third industrial revolution was about let's connect all of those devices up to computers so that we've computerized our factories. The fourth revolution is about taking that data, putting it into the cloud, and using all of the IT advances over the past few years and applying them into the factory. And just out of interest, I put five, industry 5.0 on there. I'm not, nobody knows what that will be, what will the future be, but probably it'll be about man-machine interactions man and machines coming together. It will hopefully be about ecology and how we apply ecological principles to the factories. So what are the drivers for change? So I'm going to, the, the OT people in the audience will know this diagram. This is a typical diagram of what's happening in a factory. And I'm not going to talk all the way through it. I think one observation is it's complicated, but it's also very structured. So what you find in a typical factory, there are lots of standard procedures, lots of standard interfaces. The top of the chain here is what they call the, the MES system, the manufacturing execution system that essentially controls the factory and interfaces with the very top, which is your ERPs, your enterprise systems at the top. So if all of this is already existing, why do people want to change it? Well, I guess it doesn't quite work. Um, I guess the, the thing about the, the, top of the top of the system, the MES system, is it's well defined. It's got lots of functionality, which you can see on the board. I'm not going to go through it. but. The takeaway is these are systems that you can buy off the shelf, you can install them in your factories, they're very expensive, and they're not quite doing the job. So Morgan Stanley did a review and asked, why are you taking industrial IoT into the factory? And they got their answers back, created a graph. 
But what you see about most of this, most of the things, most of the drivers are about efficiencies. So I'll look through this, operational efficiency, improving productivity. The other category on here is creating new business opportunities. What you don't see on this diagram is a couple of things I'm going to touch, to, touch on on the next slide. Um, but also, one of the big drivers that we've been told from some of the factories, one particular drinks manufacturer said to us, look, we need all of this information into the cloud because our people are getting older. The people who really know how to run the factories are retiring. So we need to get that data out of the factories and, and into the cloud. So from my perspective, if we're going to do digital transformation in a factory, it's more than just connecting up sensors. It's a proper digital transformation. Guess what? We know how to do digital transformations. And the four pillars that we find within um, a factory will be optimize operations. OK, so we had that on the previous slide. Empo empowering employees. Your people in the factory, they know what they're doing. They, they know their systems inside out. So let's give them the tools to help them do their job properly. The third segment you won't see in a typical talk like this, but I think we've got some really interesting observations on that. How do we engage customers and bring that data back to the factory? And then finally, product innovation is really based on the first three. Get the first three right, product innovation comes off doing your optimizations, empowering your employees, and engaging with your customers. So what does a digital transformation in a factory look like? Actually, it's very similar to what we would do on any project. Envisaging, right? So talking with the users, figuring out what might work, trying out proof of concepts, getting sponsorship. If I'm going to roll this out across 300 factories, I need the very top of the organization to understand what they're getting themselves into and why they need to do it. Digital culture. Let's talk to the people in the factories. Let, let, let's get them used to Agile. Let's get some product owners there who can take the, can take the message on our behalf. Again, we've got hundreds of factories that we may be rolling out to. Now, a lot of what you're seeing on these slides is based on my experiences with a particular CPG client. But it's fairly typical. What they're doing is fairly typical with other clients that I've also talked to. So put the digital culture into the, the factories, get the people energized so they know what to expect. The implementation is typically what we do, but then the adoption. How do you take something and roll it out across 300 factories? That's, hard, that's the hard bit. So we've got to have people in there who are going to take the message for us. I'm sure some of you are technical, and as an architect, I like to have something technical in my talks. So I'm going to take you through how we architect these systems, but it won't get too technical, so don't get too worried. Um, I think it's good that everybody understands something of the technologies that we're using. This is a, a DICAR model. It's used in data information, um, just as an illustration of what we're trying to do. So the data we get from our machines it's just that. It's raw data. It's completely meaningless unless you're an engineering expert on that machine. We need to take that data, enrich it to create the information. We're going to uh, create knowledge and insights from that. The med systems that we've got can do bits of that. And then we want to give that data to our users so that they can have Innovation, so they can drive their innovation from that. Um, Ron Toledo was talking earlier. He was talking about predictive analytics. But actually, the real win is prescriptive analytics. It's not just knowing that machine is going to fail in two days' time. It's knowing what is the schedule across all of the machines in the factory, what are the orders coming in, so we can prescribe in a much better way how we do this. And I've got an example later on of how we've done that for one, one of our clients. OK, so 
there are a number of drivers for people doing innovation in the factory. What we find in factories is, we find when we go into a factory and look at it, some of our clients already have MES systems in there. But what they want to do is to take the data from the PLCs, push it into the cloud, and do new things with it. So they're adding on to their existing estate. Quite typically, they would do what I would call cold path processing in there. They take the data, use big data on it, and come up with some insights. Some of our clients don't have MES systems. So in a way, they're jumping a generation. Excuse me. So if I look at some of the, some of the factories, the cost of a MES system can be millions in a factory. So all they've got is basic computerization of the factory, and they're hoping to jump a generation and put that data into the cloud. One of the typical ways we see people of getting the data into the cloud, they'll take the data from the factory, push it into a SQL database, and run a web application on it. If you're measuring energy and you're sampling your data every half an hour, it might work. But what's wrong with SQL databases? SQL databases are great at write once, read many. What do I do in industrial IoT? I'm going to have masses of data that I'm going to stuff into my database. Guess what? SQL databases don't work. So we need slightly different technologies, approaches to industrial IoT and IoT in general, to be honest. So we come up with three ways of processing the data. The big innovation for getting data over to the factory is what I would call stream analytics. So Kafka is something that uh, some people will be familiar with. If you're on Azure, they use the term streaming analytics. It's about processing the data on the fly. Enrich the data as much as you can before you put it into your database. And then we typically have three ways of dealing with the data. The first one is cold path. I take all of my big data technologies and I apply them to the big data streams that are coming in. And that allows me to create, for example, insights using AI. So this is a very quick, easy way of applying AI to the factory, creating insights and creating value from it. If you've got a factory making lots of, let me call it stuff, you'll have a lot of downtime. Any small increase in availability is a big number on the bottom line in your profitability. The warm path is typically what we would use for applications. Take data, put it in a database that's suited to time-based data, put it in front of a web application, um, and create some value. And finally, once you've created your AI models, you want to use them. So you take a hot data stream, you take the raw data from the factory, push it through your AI so that you can react to what's happening on a um, fairly quick basis. So the key takeaways of why we're doing this is let's get the data out there, democratized, out of the factories, out of the MES systems, out of the, that factory, into a place where it's available to, to your employees. The key thing then is we've got the meeting of mindsets, the meeting of the OT world and the IT world. And one of the obvious benefits from this, if nothing else, is we can do this a lot cheaper and quicker than the traditional um, systems in the factories. I've got a quote here from one of our clients. It's a public domain quote. It's not directly just to me. But what they said is, we can't deliver unless we have a platform-based approach. What you see here, this architecture, is a platform-based approach. It allows us to develop many, many applications um, on top of this. So we said before, there's four key pillars. One is optimize operations. So what do I mean by optimize operations? The key three things is process reliability. How do I keep making the same thing continuously? <coughs> really simple example. I'm putting ice, uh, chocolate onto an ice cream. I'm creating a magnet. The temperature changes. The humidity changes. The way that chocolate behaves changes. 
I've got to optimize my factory based on external conditions. How do I reliably make that product time and time again in very different conditions? Production efficiency. How do I keep my, my machines up as much as possible? So this is where predicted maintenance um, comes in. And then finally, how do I optimize my supply chain? So three different types of optimization that we can do once we've got the data there. This is an example of some work that we did with GE. Um, Baker Hughes is a GE company. We took the data that they had, put it into the cloud, um, looked at what patterns we could see in the data, and off the back of that, they achieved a 12% improvement in the availability of their machines. Empowering employees. This is a key one that people often forget, but when you think about it, your people in the factory are your biggest asset. They know how your factory works, but they often dare not change the parameters of the factory because they don't have the evidence. Give them the evidence, and then they can run with it. So the first thing is we give them a set of applications that they can use to help with their day-to-day -day jobs. Some of these overlap with what you would have in a typical factory in terms of a mess system. Some of these, um, like your process optimization, um, trying to do your um, predictive, prescriptive maintenance, things like that are things that we are really only available in the cloud. So these are the sorts of applications we're trying to put in the hands of the workforce. The other thing is power users want to do their own things. So they want to use the graphing tools that are available on the platforms. So if I'm on Azure, we have the Azure Explorer for looking at the data um, and other tools. This is what happens. The people take the data and they use it themselves. They know what graphs they need. They don't need us to tell, tell them. And then obviously Power BI, again, if the data is out there, we can use the data. Or the clients will build their own dashboards if they get access to the data. So moving on to the second tenant, customer engagement. This is quite an exciting one. This is something that um, we've been doing with one of our clients and we're trying to package it so that we can roll it out to other clients. And that is, get the data from the users of the products. Who's buying your product? What's their feedback on social media? What's the feedback, on, um, what's the feedback that they're giving in the call centers? Process that, work out which factories it applies to, and give the information back to the factories. Guess what? They can improve the product. They might even see from the feedback that product has gone out of fashion. Let's go and create a new product. Um, so the final bit is, what does Capgemini have to help clients who come to us with solutions? When, when we have requirements from clients, what solutions do we have to help them? So one of the great success stories we've got is a, is a product called XIoT. It's an IoT product that we've used for smart cities, lots of other IoT applications. Most recently, we've started adding factory-based applications to it. The nice thing about XIoT is it's completely platform agnostic. So we can take this, we can put it on Azure, we can put it on Amazon, we can put it on any cloud. So we have a set of pre-built applications. Um, and one of the recent success stories that we've had with this has been with um, Stelia in um, aero manufacturing. So here you see an example of where we did some uh, predictive maintenance on some of their machines using the XIoT product. The other thing to bear in mind is that we are vendor agnostic. We work with all of the main vendors. Um, I've personally worked on um, an Azure-based platform. We package that in terms of a demonstrator so that we can quickly get data from clients' factories, show that we can process it, and then from then on develop um, um, a real system. And this is one of our success stories in the CPG space where we're rolling out a product based on that accelerator. So the key takeaways. 
Industrial IoT is the backbone for Industry 4.0, but it's a lot more than just technology. It is about real digital innovation. It uses all of the things that actually Capgemini is really good at. IoT, cloud, big data, AI, analytics, and also digital innovation. We've seen some of the success stories and some of the um, accelerators that we've got in there. So I hope that this has given you a good insight into what Industry 4.0 is, what industrial um, digital innovation is all about. Um, if you're around later, I'm happy to, to have conversations. If I've got any questions, there's a couple of mics here. Um, so I'm open to questions. We've got four minutes left before we finish for the next talk. Any questions? If not, thank you very much for your time, and I hope that that was interesting. Thank you.